tell me a little bit about um, where you grew up and your upbringing, please. Firstly, uh, we have to start with praising God. Praising God like He is the Lord of the world, the Master of the universe. We seek His help, we seek His forgiveness. We seek refuge with God from the evil of our own souls and from our bad deeds. And whoever God guides, no one can misguide. And whoever God leads astray, no one can guide. And I bear witness there is no God worthy of worship except Allah is one and has no partners and I bear witness that Muhammad, peace be upon him, is a slave and messenger. This is something that came into my life at the age of 19, but growing up, growing up, if I could describe concrete, grey concrete slabs, red bricks, about three alleyways, each alleyway with about 52 doors. And number 36 of the bottom alleyway was my house, where we grew up, me, my mum and my little sister. For the first four years of living in that house, my dad was there as well, so it was me, my, little, my older sister, and my mum and my dad. Um, this is Central Hill Estate in Gypsy Hill, Crystal Palace, uh, Lambeth. I was born in 1982, and this is the year we moved there. Growing up on this estate was like most estates in London, probably all over the world now that I've travelled. You see, it's just many people, mainly like people of the bottom. So it's the ones that are struggling, the ones, it's the dreamers, it's the hopers, the ones that are waiting for that one day to get out. Everyone's got that same thing in common that like my memories of this estate was knocking on your next door neighbor's door, asking with a container, my mum said, can we use some bar? <laughs> knocking on that neighbor's door, because you've used this one too many times. My mum said, can we use, have you got some juice or whatever? Like, there was a shop at the top of the alleyway. But sometimes when you need things, it wasn't like go to the shop, it's still go to the neighbor's house because it's one thing. And I remember, it wasn't just us, I remember people knocking on our door. Mum said, can we have this, can you lend us that? And everyone used to send their children. I think all the parents were embarrassed or whatever, like everyone's going through the same thing. So you always send the young kids, like, go and knock on Miss Rose's door, go and knock on Beverly's door, go and knock on Ruth's door. It's all the same thing. I remember these names, these are real names, like I remember our names. So this is how we grew up. And us as kids, we, when we weren't spending our time doing that, it was we was on the estates playing with each other and there was the three different levels it was the younger kids like my generation if we're going back early we played innocent things like football had run outs on the estate and they had my sister's generation a bit older you just get into smoking cigarettes maybe or talking about boys and going to the park and they had the older generation I remember they used to sit on the steps and they was on harder drugs and they'd have the cans of tenants and all that <laughs> I just see them sitting on the steps, but I looked up to them, they were like the bad boys in the estate. And that was that was life growing up, like on the estate, it's my early memories and we just played football and that was it until mum's come out and you were here when mum's come out and call you, come in, it's dinner time, Ashley, come in for your dinner or whatever and or when it's getting dark you just know it's time to go in. And um, yeah, um. Tell me a bit about, more about your parents and um, when they were together and, and how they separated. I remember him back when mum lived with dad. The house was different because we lived on this estate, but truthfully, we had one of the best houses on the estate, even though it looked the same as everyone else from the outside. When you went inside my house, it's like we had a VCR, we had leather stays plastic over the leather. <laughs> so like, my memories of my dad is he just had money. I remember walking in the room, I must have been like three years old, but I got this vision of seeing the whole floor was full of money, he was counting in piles. And I was just thinking, well, you could buy anything in the world with that. I was only about three or four years old. And we started like designing clothes and the, my dad was just like, such a boss in my eyes. 
where I saw him and everyone would know, everyone on the estate respected him. He's like, my dad was like the father figure of this estate and he had the best car and the best clothes and he weren't one of those dads trying to be young and cool. He was a dad and he looked like a dad and he moved like a dad and he was treated like the dad of the estate. Um, I just remember seeing my mum and dad used to argue a lot. This is normal, my mum's fiery, she comes from Jamaica, like the rough part of Jamaica, like Kingston, Trench Town, where the Marley's and all that from. And she grew up hard, like, so she's got concrete skin, like, she's used to the roughness. So my mum wasn't easy going. My dad's from Jamaica as well, and he had a similar upbringing. But my dad's dad was very wealthy as well, so he was used to that kind of thing, like that. But he still had to go through such and such to get by, it was an easy upbringing. And then, them two together, they sued it, but they clashed at the same time, I think, and my mum was too angry at the world, and it was hard even for my dad to tame her. I could tell she had a lot of anger in her because of her upbringing and her coming over to England. I think she came to England when she was about 15, so my mum and dad used to argue a lot, and as young as I was, I used to see it. But it was good and bad, I think every household sees this. And then, I remember sitting on the sofa and seeing by the front door there, they're arguing. What, is that what you think, yeah? Is that what you think? I don't want to hear it. What, don't you love I us I don't want to hear it. I don't, what, don't you I can't stand seeing you. You're, you're made me sick. Yeah, you made me sick. You're sick, Francis. You're made me sick. What, don't you love Karina? Don't you love Ashley? Yeah, you know, you know, you're always my kids, right? coming from you. That's rich. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to be here. I don't want to be here. Well, come on, I'm gone. Come out here. Leave. I'm leaving out of here. Leave To her, I wouldn't say I'm a dad. I think it was both of them with the same anger. Mum was equally as bad, if not worse, I would say. The next day, I just remember waking up in the bed with my dad. Like, me and my sister in the bed, and my dad. I was like, where's mum? Where's mum? And I was like, where's mum? And I was like, where's mum? And I was gone. And that was it. I just woke up. I was gone. I was like, wow, man. Yeah, from London. Yeah, from London. I just didn't know where, where mum is. Where's mum? Eventually she got in touch and she was staying at someone's house and we went there. She said, we're going to stay here with this one year old lady, her friend, and us, and me, my sister, and my mum in the bed. And it's like, this bond was as tight. This is when the bond was like growing up now, growing up. I was about four or five, but I felt me, mum, and my sister. It's like she had this feeling like, this is us now against the world, in this bed, in someone's house. I was thinking, mum, we had a house, everything, what we did in here, in this flat. We were, so we're in this bed. And, yeah. My dad is a good man, so he said, like, go back to the house, he's on the way wait for him to go, and you go back, that's you lot, you and the kids. I remember the day we went back to the house and it was just empty, so mum had to start again. But we had back our house in the estate, and mum's got to start again now. I saw mum crying, I saw things, and I saw, like, how are we going to get new sofas, how are we going to get that? Mum never really had nothing. So it was all that before. So she's been killed. This is the beginning now. Now I watched this journey like she started studying in college. She was working part time at my school, but not getting paid voluntary. She's trying to trying to just get built up. Obviously at the same time the stress she's drinking as well, drinking, don't know where she's gonna get the next pound from. Electricity's running out and etc. And we're not even putting the electric back on. We started living in one room, even though we had a three bedroom house because it wasn't decorated, we would all stay in the one room in the house. Me and my mum and my sister, because that room had a bed in there, had everything. So we just stayed in there. And then slowly we just built up, built up, built back up, built back up. And it had for that for long. And we just built back up, built back up, and then mum got a job. I remember that day she'd come up, she was excited, 800 pound a month, 800 pound a month, like she got a job, that's what she's going to be earning. And then, yeah, that's what it was like, and I had the contact with my dad like every now and then, and there was no hatred. Every time I saw him, I was excited. I was excited, there was no hatred. I was surrounded by that. I was happy to see him, even if I saw him twice a year. I never felt like I was very wrong. Because the way I saw him was, it's, he's there, I just don't see him much. But if I want to see him, I'm allowed to. It's not like he's saying no. So I never ever felt rejected, but I felt shy to build a relationship with him. So this is because of the shyness, we hardly saw each other. Mm.
You mentioned to me before one incident where your mum um, sent to the sweet shop with a note. Can you tell me yeah. that Select. Going through transitions in life, different stages, I think. We all go through stages. I love, often people say to me, what's my journey in life? And I think, my journey is the same as your journey. I've just got different details. But the journey is actually quite similar where we start off in a stage of ignorance. We don't know what we're living for. And we don't know what we're doing. And we're just following orders and just following each other. But then an event usually takes place in one's life where that event, no matter how small or big it is, it causes one person's mind to start thinking, questioning things, and to take a turning, or take, we call it paths, like to take a different path. I remember, I was about nine, ten years old, my mum, this one time, she sent me to the shop to get some goods. And I know, you always get, I always used to get sent to my neighbours to ask for this drink, or to ask for, can we borrow this and that, but this time I remember, Mum sent me to the shop with this long list and she said, we need these things, we need these items. So, she didn't give me no money though. So I'm walking to the shop and there's a form of pride, like an embarrassment inside you, like, and they're getting there, who's going to be in there and what have you. You just, you just don't want to be doing this sort of thing. So I walk in the shop, I wait for everyone to leave and then, go up to the counter and I remember like putting the stuff there, things like probably mashed potato, corn, beef, stuff that's easy to cook and that's not that expensive. And I gave him the note and the shopkeepers looking in my eyes, reading the note, my mum's putting this note, oh can you give these goods to my son and I'll pay you on the 18th of the month when I get paid. So it must be like a week before, two weeks before. He threw the note back down and gave him the stuff. I said, tell your mum next time I'm not doing it. So me, that being the young man, like, like, you get a bit angry. I just remember picking up the stuff and walking to the door. At the part of you just wants to throw the stuff back in the shop and say, you know, just keep it. But then you know that when you go home and you tell your mum that I didn't get the stuff and threw it back in, that like, we need this stuff in it. So you have to swallow your pride and walk out of the shop and just go home with it. But that had an effect on me. Walking home, I remember thinking, why are we so broke? Like, why? Mum's got a job now. Like, you've got a job. Why can't we just afford to pay for things? And, you know, you see certain people and it looks like they can just have things. Like, they can just go to McDonald's when they want to. And their dad just says, we're going on holiday to Spain this year. And, like, what? These things push you to think. And this was an event that took place in my life where it made me to start questioning and taking a different part. I remember Mum, we was always, because of this brokenness and no money, she was always angry, always slamming cupboards, always that wanted to drink and I don't blame her, like, she's just come from Germany, she don't know how to earn, she's too much pressure for a person. This world seems to put a lot of pressure on a person's shoulders just to live and I could see that pressure was getting to my mum and I had like, drinking a lot and then obviously because drink's expensive, you tend to drink the cheaper drink which is more powerful and needful. So this is affecting her. It's a weird system what it's doing and just trying to escape the reality. Can't cope, can't cope. And the only time we was happy in the household I remember was like in the mornings on a Sunday. And you just wake up and it's just music. It was like an escape and it's like another form of a drug. Like, like alcohol and weed, smoking music is like another form of a drug. Because on that Sunday morning when I wake up and I can just hear the reggae music loud in the house. Mum ain't even thinking about problems now. She's back in Jamaica, really. The music's playing, she might have a bit of fish frying in the kitchen. That smell and that sound, she just thinks, my pride, listening to the words. And that's why when you hear music, it's like, a way they release their pain. Some of them artists are just talking about their pain and they, that's her home in Jamaica. So I remember, that's when I used to come upstairs. Because our bedrooms are downstairs in my house. And I used to see mum just cleaning up, polishing and she'd be in a good mood. This is our best times in the household through music. And I'd drain in. My, my thing was polishing. So my sister would have to Uber and all that stuff, or clean the bathroom. But for 
me, my mum used to always give me the rag and the Mr. Sheen and say, you do the polishing. So I'd polish and my mum would, and me and my mum would sing together. And I used to love reggae. I used to love chatting along to the reggae. So I'd be singing along with her. I've been missing you now. I'd be getting along with my mum. Do, 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 do. I remember. <laughs> and that was like the good times. Only then though. But it was at the good times when mum used to look at me and say, my son, like she used to say, my son, not just like son, and she would go, my son, oh my son, you're the man of the house. Like you have to look after us, you know, you're the man of the house. And if you're like 10, 11 years old, 12, and you're hearing now, and you know it, look, now it's good, but as soon as this music stops, and I'm going to be sad, you're like, yeah, I'm the man of the house, I have to do it. I have to, so I used to be like, I'm going to be rich, I'm going to be a millionaire, but trust me, I say, you're going to have everything. And I know that, I share that with enough young black youths, white youths, enough young youths, and everywhere across the globe, I share that. They think, they look at their mums, they look at the struggles we're all going through, and they all say, that I'm going to be rich one day. How though? How are they going to get there? And this is the new journey now I'm on. I'm 12 years old, I'm leaving primary school, I'm going into secondary school, feeling like a big man now, getting on the buses and trains and I need to get this, how am I going to do it? Mum's got a job, mum's broke, mum's the one crying. Teachers in my school driving like broke down Ford Escorts and they don't look like they've got great lives. So I remember like arguing with teachers in school saying, I'm going to be richer than you anyway. <laughs> like, why do I need to listen to you? What I'm going to do is going to make me more money than all of you. So next it's about um, when you saw Ismail when you rode up on the motorbike and how that felt. So who was our role models? How was I going to make this money? Like, how was I going to... Like, unfortunately on this estate where they put us, there wasn't like a lawyer walking through the estate with his briefcase every morning getting into a big Mercedes saying hi kids and driving off and you think I need to be a lawyer like you. Even though it does exist, there wasn't like accountants and I never had these few people in my family, etc. that I knew of. So, you just see the locals and the locals are all like drug fiends or sitting on the stairs with tenants or going around sitting in little weed drawers and bags of skunk and this, that and the other or ash. Or this is what they're doing, they're hustling or they're going up to the... Um, bookie shop and is gambling two pound on the horses and trying to make money, this is what they're doing. So, the ones you see with money are the big drug dealers and the big fraudsters. They come by in big cars and that and you start thinking, these are my role models. I remember one of my big role models, brother came by, we used to be playing football on the estate and you just hear Big motorbike, big motorbike, boom, 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 boom. big wheels, beautiful lady on the back of the bike, taking them turnings along, brand new R1, who first came out, first person to have a thing to have it, in South London, and you hear them stories, he went in there and he paid 10 grand cash and he walked out, and it's like, wow, and there he is, boom, boom, turning turns and like, do a wheelie, do a wheelie, that's what you're thinking, you as young kids. And then I used to look at my friends there just once, he picks up the ball looking at him going down the road and be like, yeah, that's my cousin, you know, that's my cousin. And like, this is the kind of guy you want to be like. Like, this is who you think, I want to be like him. For some, this was in the daytime, in the nighttime, you're coming in a convertible car, like, yeah, I was in my bike in the day, I'm in a car in the night, like, come in a convertible car, you see the gold chain, gold teeth in the mouth, and it's almost like you see it in slow motion, like, because you're just imagining it, it's like you just see it, and this is a convertible bike, like this is the life. And um, yeah, you just want to adapt their ways. And if it, these are our role models on the streets, and then when we go home, who looks similar to them? We turn on the TV, and we see the rap stars, and they are our role models. And can you blame a youngster to want to be like that? A lot of people say, like, why do you want to be like this? Why do you want to be a rap star? Like, you can't. You can't compare them, you can't blame them for wanting that. Like today, nearly, I'd say like 
eight out of ten youngsters are rappers, like for the youth or into music, to trying to make music. But you can't really blame them because they look at the lifestyle that comes with it and the money that comes with it and the illusion is, it's the answer to their problems and it will bring success. So I used to watch these videos and see these rappers rapping Versace shades, rings, diamonds, everything, women, villas, swimming pools, and it's become to be just like that. That I need a house just like that for mom life, etc. So that was the next step, that was the next journey trying to make that money to get there. And unfortunately you think how can I get it fast? That fast I need it, I need it. So you start doing things that are like criminal activities and that it's not for a kick out of it always. It's not because you think everyone will respect me more if I do this crap or I'll be the man for doing this crap. It's for results. It's just because you want to like be able to progress in life and you think that's an option, that's something that will help you get a stepping stone. Like a lot of people I meet now who come from better areas and better backgrounds and they'll say, how do you get your first car? My dad did for me. When I passed my exam, my dad bought my first car. <laughs> in like, uh, how, well, how do you get your, where are you going to live when you get married? Oh, my parents are going to give me one of their houses. I agreed to go and let me see at this party and I noticed there's a lot of guys there from all the different estates in South London. From Brixton to Streatham to Clapham to back to my estate, Gypsy Hill. And it was like a family, it was like a unit, uni, uni, uni. everyone was united, like it's like a reunion, all the different people from all the different areas united under this one roof. And I thought it was only because of the party why it was like that, but I went back there like a couple of days later just to chill. The brother said he wants to speak to me and I noticed it was similar. It was, all, it was like a packed house. It was always that same family unit vibe. And that's when we decided to start a group SMS. And me and one of the brothers was funding all the equipment and building a studio. And we always had loads of people around. It was a big room giving their opinion, like, that sounds rubbish, that sounds good, or no. Nah. It was a good vibe in the studio. It was a place where it wasn't really foolishness, like, we didn't really invite girls around or anything like that. We were boys, we were kind of focused, we just used to, like, play the computer or think of business ideas with each other and make music and rap and write lyrics and there'd be a bit of smoking going on and maybe some drink, etc. But it was, we weren't on the streets and we weren't causing trouble. Everyone would have spent their days because you're bored. Everyone would come there. And this is a big problem when you're growing up. This is a question everyone asks every day. They wake up, they look outside, they get dressed, and then they say, what are we doing? No one knows what we're doing. Like, what are we doing? It's a big problem. What are we doing? I don't know why. And this started going into my music. I started writing songs about this sort of things like I don't understand this life and I remember it's the love song like by Jay-Z This can't be real, this can't be life, there's gotta be more, this can't be life Oh, like these were my songs in Tupac like What's happening, what happened one day if heaven's got a girl like these, these songs and I just didn't know what we was living for I shadow I shadow And And لا إله لا إله إلا الله إلا الله ومحمد ومحمد رسول الله رسول الله I bear witness I bear witness that there is no deity that there is no deity worthy of worship worthy of worship except الله except الله and Muhammad, and Muhammad is his messenger. Is his messenger. Allahu Akbar. Alhamdulillah. I took my shahada and everyone's face was glowing. I said, like, I declared there's no God but Allah and that Muhammad is his final messenger. Everyone was glowing and standing up and looking through their pockets to give me a present. I found beauty in this, in this religion. I found tranquility and like, peace. And kind of like, 
this eating from one plate in there and chilling with people of different races, different nationalities. The things that used to matter to us, as me and my friends, didn't really matter in this room. Like, it didn't matter, like, the things we were fighting for as young boys, and, like, they were so different. If a woman was interested in you, like one of these young Muslims, it was like, they would say, like, she wants to know how much you read or how much do you know about this and that and like she's not she's more put off if you're just all about cars and this and the way you dress and why do you spend so much money so it was like the complete opposite from what I was used to like I was used to like I didn't have a girlfriend but I remember dating and it was easy for a girl to look at me and go oh I know what that is or I know this restaurant or I know this club or I know that but if you ask a girl like do you know what the purpose of life is oh no I don't know that you know about watches and cars and this, but you don't know the purpose of life. So it was just meeting people with substance, and I found contentment, I found peace in that room. And yeah, it took much harder, became a Muslim. It wasn't easy though. I left that house, I felt different, and I was like, this is my new, like, I'm a Muslim now. How do I go home and tell my mum, like, what do I do? But the man said to me, look, take your time, take steps, st seek knowledge first start praying like take it in steps and that's what i had to do i didn't plan to be the best overnight i just knew right, this is what i really want so i'm not delaying it but i'm not going to lie to myself i need to be honest with myself and do things in my time and that's what i did i took steps and everything started happening gradually and it was a struggle to quit certain things like criminal activities and music and stuff, it was a big struggle, but I didn't force myself. I waited till the time was right. And the first thing was the music. I, I spent a certain amount of days in the mosque, 10 days in the mosque for Itakaf, and when I came out, I no longer felt the hunger for music. Like, I had to go and perform at a college. And when I went to perform there, I remember it, all the kids were so excited, and it was like, we're gonna, coming out to rap this, and, and I kind of didn't feel it no more. I just spent 10 days in the mosque. So they done question and answers first before we wrapped and the first question someone said was is it true when you're a Muslim? So I was like yeah. Second question the teacher saying who else has got another question for this group? Second person put up their hand and girl why are you a Muslim? <laughs> so I said oh, because so I explained myself. Next person that's deep. So what a Muslim's allowed to? Next question it's nothing about music they just keep asking about this religion but this is young people we all walk around like we know what we're doing and we're flying and we're all about our Nike and that. But the truth is, we're more interested in life, like what are we doing here? We've all got this question inside us. No one really knows what they're doing. And that's why they're just left following people. So when we came there, look at that hunger. Everyone wanted to know about the religion and why and etc. And you saw it spread all across London, South London. I remember getting picked up by the police saying look you're responsible like you and your crew converted so many people to this religion and you're worse than the rds when they came and this that like what is this and i said look this is young people not knowing what they're living for not getting taught much and not having and finally finding time to think and when they use their time to think they read this is where they ended up they might not be the best at it I don't usually, but I, you, I saw the hunger, I'm going to do it with you. So I started doing lessons with him. And this was my first period of like getting the bus, the train and that. Because you know, I had pride before, I always had more bikes, I always had a, a car to drive. Well, for not, I drive like my mum's car. But now I used to have to get trained to go and see him in June. And my lessons were good, but they weren't enough. Because when I came out of that room where I was learning with him, I went back on the streets and people recognised me or knew me and was like, weed. And I felt still uncomfortable. When, distracted on two paths. So he said to me, when I go to Egypt and learn, you can clear your head that way and you know what you want from this life. You'll understand more and you'll be more comfortable because right now it seems like you're all over the place. And I said, you're right, I am. I don't know which way I'm going. Like I want this, but then I need to make money. And to make money, what am I gonna do? I don't really know. So I was all over, I went to Egypt and Egypt was, it was good. It was good for me and it was good and it was a reality 
eye opener. I saw that. I thought the Muslims there would be perfect and it would be peaceful, we would live on this desert and it would just be like pure. Everyone would just be noble, but I saw the reality is that there is no perfection in this world and everyone's struggling. So this is why we have to spend less time focusing and putting people down for their struggles and more time trying to build people up from their struggles and helping them to do better. Because surely if you see someone struggling, you're going to be rewarded more for helping them with their struggle and helping them do better by opening the palm and offering them a hand rather than closing the palm and pointing the finger. You're not going to get no reward for that. So it's seeing everyone struggling, seeing everyone doing bad, it made me want to start helping. That's how the help started and I remember I was talking to some outside of university and I learned a lot and I saw Egyptians who were born Muslim and they still didn't know much and it was, it just made me want to start. People was questioning me, so how did you learn this? How did you learn to pray? And I was always telling my story and then that's when I started writing the film. And then I got back to England and I uh, got asked to do documentaries and talk on this show and that show and that's how the name Muslim Bilal got out there in the Muslim world as a speaker because I was asked like we just came back can you speak here can you speak there and I kind of didn't want to at first but I can't suppose it was just like I've always struggled to say no sometimes like even if I don't want to say yes, I have to say, I say yes just because I don't want to let people down or I don't want them to be upset. So yeah, I ended up talking at mosques and talking at schools and talking at events. And all praise to God because actually it was became like an income. I was getting offered money by schools and stuff and I didn't know how I was going to make money. And it became like an income and I was doing it like it was work. It's like it was just work for me, like, and it was work that I enjoyed. And someone said, find a job you love, you never work a day in your life. So I was like, instead of being a taxi driver or something, and you're working and you're seeing all this and all these customers, my work is actually doing something I love. I'm talking about my religion and why I became it, and I'm inspiring young people, and I'm traveling the world, and I find myself in Malaysia, and I find myself in Minnesota and Morocco, and Egypt and everywhere, all over the world, New York, New Jersey, St. Louis, just with different young people speaking about life. And that's my work, and I'm getting paid to do it. Couldn't thank God enough. Felt like a great opportunity, but what comes with it is the commentary from everyone around you. Like, they think they know what you're doing, but they don't. Someone's telling me I'm a rap star again. He told you I'm a rap star. He saying rap to me. <laughs> Someone's telling me I'm this or I'm doing that or I think this is a form of worship. What I'm doing is an innovation. This isn't a form of work. Who told you this is a form of worship? This is my work, this is my job. For it to be an innovation, it has to be a form of worship. It has to be in accordance with the way that our Prophet done it, peace be upon him. And the intention has to be for the sake of God, but not with your job. There's a lot of lack of understanding, but it wasn't for me. I don't really respond to it because it's not for me to go around and say, why are you saying this? Why are you saying that? Why are you doing this? If you see the people we're following, the more wiser people in this world, who we call the Sahaba as a companion, they just conveyed the message. And if they want to listen, they listen. If they don't, then there's no time to argue. Today, I think the internet, you'll see most of the time, everyone's just arguing. Arguing, 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 arguing. There's no time for that. We're all struggling. That's the bottom line. And we all need to help each other. We don't put each other down, we help each other. There's rewards in that. And if we're living for rewards, then this is what we need to spend our time doing. Helping each other. It's not about putting each other down. There's no reward in it whatsoever. There's no good deeds. Yes, you made someone cry today, here's a good deed. Yes, you broke this person's heart today, here's a good deed. It's about being real and trying to help each other, being real with ourselves. So yeah, I came back from Egypt, I went away, I travelled to Kuwait. And Kuwait was amazing, my classes every day in Kuwait. Uh, with Abdullah al-Farsi and learning Qur'an there. It was peace of mind and it changed me. And yeah, I feel like I don't want to be known now for being a great actor. 
if I died, I don't want to be known for being the great poet. If I died or the great speaker, more just like inspiration and hope, like yeah. He can to have things and to do things and you're embarrassed when you ain't got things and when you can't do things, so you try your best to have things and do things and to make things of yourself. And you just think the ones with things and that have things and that do things get the most attention and love. So you think you have to be there as well and that will help you get it. So, yeah, we started this group and we were getting successful and the music was just all about that searching, not understanding what we're living for because, to be fair, Everything I wanted when I was like 12, 13, now we had it. Uh, we gained that money, I had a motorbike, now I had a pen. I wasn't asking shopkeepers to pay you next week and that. Like, my barbers was taking haircut money off me and not giving me my change, and I was saying, that's it's cool. Like, I didn't need to pay seven, I could just leave the ten. Or whatever. So, we were doing all right. And the music was just, it was just easy for me. I stopped feeling like I needed a pen. I see people struggling, I'm being honest, in the studio, they hear a beat and I see them with a pen and a paper and they're thinking, they're racking their brain like, how am I going to attack this track? And me, I could just listen to the beat and just say, no, I'm ready now. So one day I was in the studio and it was a busy day and I hadn't seen Mrs. Mayola or the brother. studio there's like I say ten of us in there and there's weed smoke, there's computer games and see there's mobile rooms. There's mobile rooms I think mean, it's around September, October 2001. So solid just one of mobile rooms. And September 11th just happened. That's it. A month after September 11th we're in October 2001. So sorry to get called up and win a mobile awards and everyone's watching this young guys from that Brixton Neil Neutrino was from that one from Clapham Junction. So they're near our locality. And look what they've achieved. This is like the first set of youngsters from our kind of era to achieve something legitly. They are not in America. They're close to home. And look what they've achieved. These guys have got big cars, jewellery. Women, business, huge money. There was rumors that a video cost 300 grand to make. And they're from around the corner. I have the same talent they have. Look what they've achieved. So watching them win this award, and there's not even no hatred. I wasn't really built like that. It's more like, wow, congratulations, love. But it's motivating, motivational. Because now I'm thinking about me. I've seen you now straight away turn to me. What do I have to do? And see them achieve that. Straight away people was obviously thinking that like, we need to achieve something like that. It's achievable. Someone's like, look, we've got to try and achieve this by next year. Now I knew this day or something that like Ismail was around. He'd been back. And what's funny is when he comes in the room, I can't remember piece by piece, it's ten years ago, but I remember a conversation about this award, is that what you're preparing yourself for next year? What's your purpose in life? Where do you come from? Why are you here? Where are you going? I want to be that sort of focused person because I think that when you can answer that, that emptiness, that unhappiness that everyone has in common, of walking around unhappy, smiles on their faces, everyone's covering it up with a smile, I think that that Knowing what you're living for is what replaces it, fills that little piece of emptiness and where you no longer have to walk around unhappy because you're only unhappy because you don't understand. It's like disappointment. Everyone's disappointed in someone or something. But when you don't expect much from this life because you understand this life, how do you have time to be disappointed in this life? 
you have to understand it. So I felt like I wanted to read more into what Ismail was saying. As young as I was, I wanted to like go out and get books and understand what this life's really about. Where do I come from? Why am I here? Where am I going? I need to get my head around this. Like, is it all about just making this money, making this money and helping my parents or going to work? You know, before I was thinking this world I need to be successful, like, I need to have as much money as I can, I need to help my mum, I need to help everyone. The truth of the life of this world kind of just elaborate what Ismail was saying about this life is temporary, it's short. Real happiness comes in comfort, comfort with your parents, with your family, your loved ones and you know, comfort with your creator, understanding why you're here and returning. Returning to him in good stead. Like him being pleased with you. It's that comfort of people being pleased with you. Like, so, I read that book. And I say this was the next stage in my life. Like after the, the first stage of ignorance, not knowing what you're living for. And then the events that take place. I say this is the events. And it leads to the next stage of questioning and exploring and then the next stage is finding out where do you submit or do you like deviate is it too much for you like this is all too much and you deviate or do you submit do you go in a bit further and I say I decided to go in a bit further and for the reason that I realised we're all just following the system that's it like it's like we're all just following the system that's why everyone's like this we, we I don't have no, I needed to open my mind. Why am I a Christian? Why? Because my mum is and because my grandmother is and because her grandmother is or because I was born in England and everyone in England is. Like, it's just a system. Why do I do Easter? Why do we do that? It's just a system. We're all just following. And then my kids will follow it because I'll do it and their kids will follow it because they'll do it. So I thought, no, I need to break the cycle and understand because the system clearly ain't working because no one's content. So this is why I wanted to go into it. Like you have to question things. Uh, like it's like if now, remember someone said to me like, if we was to just get taken from this spot where we are right now, and we open our eyes and we was on the desert, three of us on the desert, and there's a t table and chair, and nice food, and then there's one tree over there, and a man jumping up and down by the tree, would we just start eating the food and just continue a conversation as normal? Would we? go over to the man and start jumping under the tree with him. We wouldn't. Well, the first thing we do is we'll say, how did we get there? For what we've been on the desert. Why is that man jumping under the tree? Like, what's going on here? So, that's kind of like what I feel like we're doing in this life. We're not questioning how did we get here? Why are we here? What are we doing here? Most of us are just like, walking straight over to the tree and just jumping up and down like the man just following what everyone else is doing and not allowing itself time to think. So I started thinking, I read these books and without much, without much convincing, I said at 19, in around May, June, I made some big changes. Actually, from when I was 16 years old, 15, and I just left secondary school. The only grade that I really done well was drama. So I, like, I got an A in drama and the rest was like a couple of C's and E's and D's. And I remember we had an advert on the radio saying there's a new film, it's like a first urban film, it's called Storm Damage and they want people with natural talent that are allowed to come and audition for it. You don't have to be anyone. So 15 is my mum's this weekend, this is a big chance. Like, so she took me down to the BBC and it was like X Factor. Like hundreds of people, numbers pinned on them, I'm just one in, one in 800 or one in a thousand. And we were going in the room, there's like groups of 16 and they'll come out and they'll tap a couple on the shoulder and say come back this afternoon and I kept getting through each round. This was like my first thing that I was seeing myself get through, get through rounds but I kind of like from the MC competitions, I always used to win them. It's like I had this thing in me where I just listened to everyone else and I just think, I probably do it better than that. <laughs> it's not even confidence, I just feel like this was something that at the time I thought this was something God like out of everyone's some people can just do mechanical stuff, some people can play football. I've got a lot of friends who grew to be professional footballers. 
like this was something that I could do. So I done it, I kept getting picked back to go the next day, the next day, and then they said they phoned one day, I think I was, I can't remember if it was in Ikea. And it's like, hi, is this Ashley Chin? It's like, you know, we're gonna offer you the part. I was like, oh, the moon, I'm gonna be in a film. I was like 15, just about to turn 16. By the time we were 16, we were filming. So at 16, having like a Jaguar car, some days, the next day a Mercedes, a man with a suit, pulling up on my stick. Your driver's outside, and I'm coming out of the estate, and I'm getting in this big luxury like Jaguar, getting in the back, there's a bottle of water ready for me, a script, and they're driving me to set. And I get there and there's someone ready to open my door and to say, Mr. Chin, your trailer's this way, I'm only 16. And they're walking me and then there's a door with Ashley Chin. And I was, it was me, I used to share with Ashley Waters, so it'd be Ashley Chin, Ashley Waters. We'll be in this trailer together. And we're going in there at 16th. This is us. And we're just like, well, hey, there's a water trailer over there with Peter yeah, clothes from Gap, everything. You can, I'm like, well, you can just take any clothes. <laughs> just wear it. What do you think we can take it home after? It's, like, it's a big thing. Maybe for some of them, they kind of knew their life was going to go that way. Because they went drama school, and then they went on to this school. So they always knew one day we want to be in film. But for me, this was just out of, out of the blue. Where did this come from? I wasn't expecting this. So everyone else got their checks through the post, threw me through their agent. I used to get mine in hand. I remember the first AD calling me to a room and saying, here's your money, actually, every week. Because I never had an agent. I never had nothing like that. And there's a lot of money for me at that age, like the same thousand going into my bank account. And it's like, wow, this is it now. So I didn't go to college, didn't go to university, nothing like that. I was, this is what people go to college to become, right? I'm there now. And straight after, the lady called me who casted me for it and said, hey, Ashley, there's a play in the West End, Royal Court Theatre. They, they need a young boy, do you want to go up for it? I said, yeah, why not? So I went up for that and they said, hey, you got the part. I was thinking, everything I've got, I just got the part. I was leaves rolling in the West End now for months. So I'm getting checks going in the account again every week. So I'm on another few thousand, so I see him, this is it. But um, every day I come off stage, and like I said, I'm going back to that state. And it's like everyone on my stage is so different from the world I was seeing in that theatre and those films. And it's like I couldn't even talk to people on my state about what I just saw. Like, you know, I was just like on stage with that person from EastEnders and that guy from there. And just, you're like, it was, a bit, it was a bit surreal. But it gave me ambition. It gave me a bit of ambition, like it was a bit of a top up of my ambition that I can achieve certain things that I feel sorry for some of my like, peers, like some of my friends, because where do they get that extra ambition from? Like, um, so after, I'd say the fame and the known thing wasn't really new to me. I'd Muslim Allah. And some people would say to me, oh, Muslim Bilal, like, what made you choose that as your stage name? What's your real name? Is Muslim Bilal your stage name? I'm saying that. Like, stage name? I ain't got a stage name. Like, Muslim Bilal is the name I chose. As in, when I was a Muslim, they said, what name are you going to pick? And I chose Muslim Bilal. Like, this is not a stage I didn't plan to come to the stage as Muslim Bilal. I've been requested to come on stage and do certain things, so I'm just doing it because of my past. Like, it's not something I planned. And then sometimes, it's difficult. Like, sometimes you get people saying, oh, you, you're doing that for the fame, or you shouldn't be doing it for that. Like, everyone's, when you're in the spot, like, everyone's got something to say. It's, you've put yourself out there, basically. You're, you're saying, look, this is, you're showing people, you are exposing yourself for everyone to have an opinion of you. Because of the way the mind works today, we spend more time sharing our opinion of others than we do just working on ourselves. There's a way we've been distracted. It's a way that the devil has got us to spend our time. And we'll realise that we're losers for doing it. Only but we'll realise later when we're in the grave, like look how much time I spent looking at other people and watching what other people are doing. I should have been spending that time focusing on me. I'm sure that person I'm talking about, like, I remember once I said a quote where they forget about God and think about me. I forget about them and think about God. Because, believe me, like, this is, uh, 
I, I can see what they can see, but I ain't got time to focus on it. Life is short. So a lot of some people will say things like, oh, he's doing that for fame. And I think to myself, they don't know really what my life is like to think that I'm doing this for fame. Like this, for <laughs> fame. I didn't even choose to do this. I don't even like really make a website, no. So, but can you go around and spend all day trying to answer everyone's questions and trying to tell people, no, excuse me, no, I'm not doing it for fame. I'm actually doing it because the man asked me, can I do it? There's some youngsters who'd like to hear something. So I said, okay, I'll do it, I'm available. Like, like, sometimes you have to learn to leave the people with their opinion and just pray for the people that they become understanding. But like I said before, we can't expect too much from the people. Like, I can't expect everyone to understand and to be like perfect. Because that's not what this world is about. It's an imperfect world. And I think it's imperfect for a reason. It makes us, because it's not perfect, and it's so messed up. It makes us look forward to another life. And it makes us work harder to want to get another life. Because when this life is going perfect and everything's great, you kind of get comfortable here. And you kind of think, I don't even want to leave here. Like, this is me. And you get attached and it's not good for us. So it's that imperfectness that we see that makes us say, well, I can't wait for what's to come. And I want to work harder for what's to come. So yeah, it's not easy, man. Um, The films, the, um, the films continued and TV shows continued because it's like, what's that saying that like, I need money to live but I don't live for money? The reality is that like, you do need money to live. Like, you can't just have spiritual goals, like I've got so much spiritual goals, like I want to do this, I want to go to Saudi, I want to get close to God, but you've got to balance your goals with spiritual goals, with physical goals with financial goals, with family goals. You can't just focus on one. This is, you have to complete it. You can't just stay in a church all day and say, I'm just religious. What about your family? What about it? This is not being a religious person. Your religious duties is also to look after your family, take your kids to the park, go feed the ducks, go on. Like, this is also religious duties. You can't just sit in the church all day and say, I'm religious. So at the same time as that, like getting that name in the films, it was happening as Muslim Allah. Like, I would get requested. I wouldn't say I was ready to be a preacher or a speaker at Islamic events or a role model. I just was asked, like, can you speak at this event? And I would. And I, can you speak at that event? And I would. And I always spoke from now. I just spoke the truth. I just said what I see. I see there's big problems in this world. I see us as youngsters, like, we're surrounded by guns and roses, meaning, like, after when the guns fire, someone dies and everyone goes and puts flowers there. So there's this death every day. And I said, I'm inspired by the story of Moses, like, how, what he, did, how he was raised and what he became, etc. And then Allah have mercy on these, this soul of mine, have mercy on us, because we're like a bunch of people running around not knowing living for etc so I used to like talk about it and talk about our problems expose them but not in a way like we're putting anyone down like saying I'm not talking to you I'm talking to us but it had a big effect I think my honesty but it's had a big effect and I was talking to a lot of young people and they could relate it's like I was talking in a language they understand so it's like they could relate to me they could relate to what I was saying I'm just being honest I speak from the heart someone told me when you speak from the heart you connect with the heart. If you speak from the mind, it's like it won't even go past their heads. So I used to speak from my heart at these events and to add style to it. I used to rhyme when I'm speaking. So not just only talk, I'd rhyme with my talk because I knew this would entertain the kids. I didn't say like I want to be a Muslim rapper or I want to be a Muslim superstar or Muslim that. I just said, I knew this is something I wanted to do. I was just rhyming, like this is my style. And I'm a reggae star to it, and you can be rap star to it. I don't, didn't really care what names they associated with it. I wasn't, it's just something I was doing. What's your future ambitions for your career? My future plans at the moment is I wrote a film.
a CD of Latin poetry, and I think I want to release all three. And I think it could have, it's like closure for me. So if I wanted to come out, because recently I, was, I found myself trying to think of things I want to do, but everything I want to do seems to put me in the spotlight. Everything I'm talented at is things that is in the spotlight. And I'm not really someone deep down who likes being in the spotlight. So this is why I went to Kuwait recently to get some time out, etc. I think that will be a closure to my spotlight. Thank you.